Okay, of course, I forgot to hit the mute. So now you should be able to hear me un un to unmute myself. So, hi, Heather from the Roberts Library. By the end of this COVID-19, we're going to have this down, I promise. Um, I've got a couple of announcements before we get started with Legacies and Lunch. Um, we are having some curbside pickup with the library system the um at 13 branches i believe but check our website at cows.org and you should be able to uh drop off and pick up your items um for right now while we're closed but get all the details there because i don't know all the details um virtual programming we are doing tons of virtual programming while we're closed on youtube live facebook live and zoom most everything is archived there on um, YouTube, so you should be able to, um, okay, hang on just a second. Okay, too many screens. Um, so you should be able to get all of um, virtual programs, that's what I was talking about, virtual programs. Um, you should be able to see whatever you want. Cooking demos, story times, these kind of programs like Legacies and Lunch, all on our YouTube channel, um, Central Arkansas Library. Or you can also look under the hashtag cows in the house. Um, you can also go to cows.org or robertslibrary.org for a list of upcoming live programs. Speaking of live programs, this Friday at 5.30, we're going to have Second Friday Art Night. Um, and it's going to be awesome. We're going to do it virtually. You can't come to the building still. So we're going to bring Second Friday Art Night to you and to your living room or your office or wherever. You can be outside. Um, so 5.30 this Friday, May 8th. We're going to have virtual tours. We're going to have a cheese dip demo. And we're going to do some interactive EOA. That's Encyclopedia of Arkansas Trivia. So that should be fun and exciting. One service that we're offering um, the whole library system is offering it, but at Roberts, you can ask a librarian or you can ask a genealogist. And we are here for you Monday through Saturday, 9 until 6, um, at the phone at the main Roberts Library phone number. So that's 501-320-5700. Or you can email us 24-7 at arcinfo at cows.org. Now be aware that there's really only one person answering the phone and working in that section of the building at any one time. So we probably will have to take your request or take your question and get back to you. But we're trying to do that as quickly as possible and keep our social, social distancing up. There's a survey at the top of the description on this YouTube video. And at the end of Legacies, I would love to have, um, I would love to have you fill that out to let us know how we're doing. Um, and at the end of the video or the presentation, you will be able to ask questions in the chat field. Um, and so hopefully this is all gonna work. I've got Brian Robertson on the Zoom channel right now. And um, we're gonna get started. So give me just a second to switch some stuff around and we'll get going. Now say something. Something. Arkansas Vietnam War Project. Okay, they should be hearing you now. You're not gonna believe what I had to do to get this to work. Okay, so go ahead and start. Okay. Um, and I'll let you know if it if we get a text. Okay. Okay. I will, I will start then. Thank you everybody for your patience as we uh, work through all these technical difficulties of working from home. Heather's at her house and I am at her, my house, and we're trying to make all of this work. But now on to the show. Um, I am the project director for the 
Arkansas Vietnam War project that's part of the Central Arkansas Library System. We've been doing that project for several years now. It's a uh, kind of a natural extension of an earlier project that we did, the Arkansas Korean War project, which is uh, actually an award-winning project that we collected uh, interviews with Arkansas's Korean War veterans, and so we uh, we thought this would be a natural extension. Our plan all along was once we had kind of finished with Korea that we would move into Vietnam, and so we started that a few years ago. And then we just had a really big push in the last several months as part of the uh, National Endowment for the Arts grant, a big grant grant that we got that we've been working on getting more interviews done for the Vietnam War Project. And as part of the Big Read Grant, we're hoping to bring in Tim O'Brien. Later in the year, he was scheduled earlier in the year, but with all the uh, pandemic stuff going on, that's got scheduled. But uh, look for him later in the year, and he'll be talking about his Vietnam novel, The Things They Carry, which is a classic. I encourage you all to read it. Um, on the screen here, you'll see this. This is the Vietnam War Project homepage, and at the top of it, there are a few tabs that you can click on whenever you get a chance to check out the project. There's a Veterans tab, a History of the War, which, as it sounds, is a history of the war. We've got a list of Arkansans, all the Arkansans who were killed in action. And then there's also an About the Project tab, which if you click on that, that will give you the information about the project. Um, how you can contact us, the sort of things we're looking for, that sort of thing. But kind of the, the meat, if you will, of it is the Veterans tab. And it, once you go to that, you'll see some basic biographical information on the veterans that we have been in contact with. Now, just to, to clarify, th these are only ones that we have been in, in touch with in regard to the project itself. This is not in any way every Arkansas Vietnam War veteran, though we, we definitely want to reach as many as we can. And uh, so we've been collecting all sorts of material as part of this project. There's a questionnaire form that we start off with that we send to all of the guys, and you can actually download that on the About the Project tab from the home page. And what that is, it just has some basic biographical information as well as some um, information specific to the veterans service, what branch they were in, uh, what unit, what time period they were there, and then some other more general questions about their service. And then of course, the, the main part that we're doing is we're doing the oral history interviews. So far we've done over 50, uh, which is a pretty good number with veterans from all different branches, Army, Navy, Marine Corps, Air Force. Like I said, we're always looking for more. And then as part of the, um, the oral histories to kind of supplement that and give a fuller picture or better understanding of each uh, servant men's um, service, we're also collecting documents and photographs, which you can see a few of those here now. Here's, uh, I'm going to show you some of the photos, just a sampling of photos that we've received, and then we'll also show you some other things as well, some clips from some of the interviews. Uh, the, these first photos here from David Haas, I, I think they're kind of interesting as far as on a timeline goes. Uh, these fo the photo on the left is right before he shipped out to Vietnam, his church threw kind of a going away party. And uh, he has some photos from that, and that's what the uh, photo on the left there is. And the, the photo on the right is actually him leaving Adams Field. He's about to get on that plane and to head off to Vietnam. And as one of our uh, first clips I'm going to show here is from Eddie Pinnell. He was in the Marine Corps, and he's going to be talking about what his – first impressions were when he arrived in Vietnam. Well, we, we got into Da Nang, and then when they opened uh, that door and we walked off that C-130, the first thing that you felt was the heat. The heat was like a blast furnace. I mean, it just hit you in the face and, and, and took your breath away. Uh, you weren't prepared for 100 and something degree heat. And, um, and then as we're walking
walking off the tarmac there into the, uh, the building, you know, over on the side, you, you, you see 30 green uh, bags. And somebody said, what is that? And the guy out there with the garden hose washing these bags off. And somebody said, those boys are going home. They're body bags. 19 years old, and then I'm thinking, what have I gotten myself into? People are really dying over here. This is not a John Wayne movie, you know? In this next clip, uh, James Mitchell, who was a a corpsman in the U.S. Navy, who was attached to the Marines, he's going to tell us about his first experience when he arrived in country. Well, I uh, I got walked off the helicopter, ran into another corpsman there that uh, uh, greeted me and uh, told him who I was, and he said, "Bring your stuff, uh, gear across the road, and I'll show you where your hooch is going to be that you'll be staying in, and uh, we'll get your gear stowed, and I'll show you through the bunker." And I said, "Well, okay." We crossed the road, uh, stowed my gear, and uh, we came back. Uh, was milling in, in and around the bunker there for probably 15 minutes at the most. And uh, our, our call sign there at uh, LC Baldy was 7 Up. And uh, the radio uh, heard this 7 Up, 7 Up come over the radio. And uh, another call sign behind that, which meant nothing to me at the time. And it was a helicopter that was inbound with uh, a casualty. And um, I'm standing around there not knowing uh, what's going on. Actually, I'm I'm just uh, totally green at this point. And uh, everybody's moving and they're all moving toward the back door. And I kind of ease around and walk on out that way. And uh, it's a medevac helicopter, a uh, Huey, uh, flying in with a, a wounded, uh, I can't remember if he was South Vietnamese Army or U.S. at this point. Uh, it's, it, I just cannot remember. But uh, severely wounded soldier, and they rushed him in and started uh, uh, starting IVs and working on him. And uh, he was, uh, he passed away shortly after they got him in the bunker and uh i'd been there less than 20 minutes and watched my first man die and uh uh knew it wasn't in arkansas anymore so yeah we've been collecting as you've seen just in these first couple of clips um some really powerful stories um that when we been talking to the veterans they've they've had a lot to share and it's it's been important to catch these as as i tell a lot of folks is you know if you don't tell your story nobody else will and so i think that's one reason it's so important for us to be able to record these stories and serve them for future generations and um up next are actually a few of the photos that mr mitchell gave us he had talked about landing zone baldy or that that's where these photos are right here. I'm just going to scroll through some of them. And these shots here with the, the kids, um, one, one of the things that they did, um, that Mr. Mitchell did as well as some other guys is as part of kind of the hearts and minds uh, thinking behind the war, they they did a lot of work helping local civilians, Vietnamese civilians, and so they had um, a lot of locals that would come in and get medical attention. Mr. Mitchell talked quite a bit about that, what they could do to help the local communities there, and obviously they were well appreciated. And these are just some of those photos. We we've gotten over three thousand photos so far, and. Um, like I said, this is just a sampling. You know, a lot of the guys talk about kids and, you know, what it was like being around these kids in a war zone. And uh, these particular kids here, 
um, the men in Mr. Mitchell's unit, he they basically kind of adopted them, not formally adopted them, but, you know, looked after them and took care of them. And the, uh, the men would write home to their families and ask for clothes and different things for the kids there. And in that photo in the bottom, the two uh, red wagons, uh, those came from home as well, from the U.S. that they had, had shipped over. So there are a lot of, you know, stories like that that you get that, you know, not everything is about combat. And um, there are a lot of, you know, human side stories as well that are great to listen to and to, to hear. This next clip got uh, David Haas, who was in the Army. He's talking about what it was like dealing with some of those civilians um, that weren't always so friendly. Well, they, they captured him and, and took him into the uh, order room and uh, searched him and found out he had a complete diagram of the whole company area. Everything new how many people were in each uh, 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 hut and everything, where everybody was at. Wow. So we were being set up right then. Mm -hmm. And by and large, the Vietnamese would be your friend by day and your enemy by night, and you didn't know it. I mean, you know, they'd come right back in and work the compound. And so you... you uh, right now, I'm just, I'm, I'm like this because it, it just brings back memories of, of, of you had to be uh, just uh, watching every move every of everything. Anything that's out of the ordinary, you better find out what was going on. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it was, made you very tense the whole time. Here are just a, a few other photos, as, as well as uh, a Navy, uh, Marine Corps commendation from one of our veterans, Larry Weaver. And in this clip, we've got uh, Daryl Couch, who was a uh, fighter pilot with the Air Force. He's talking about a, a close air support mission that he performed one night. He gives a really good description of what that was like. A battalion of North of Vietnamese regulars had positioned themselves between Lac A base and the artillery base, and their mode of operation was to capture the artillery base. There were a battalion is about 600 men. They were they had the road cut between Lac A and there, so they couldn't get resupplied. Resupplied helicopters had a just a withering fire to try to come in and land and resupply the guys. The only supply support they had was an armored personnel carrier that was coming from a base further north called Quan Loy. I know I spent a lot of time there. Not a lot of time, but some time. Coming from Quan Loy to Lai K, it got dark. You didn't drive on the roads in the dark. So they stopped. So they had the artillery fire base with like four 105s and the crews for them and uh, munitions and our armored personnel carrier with 10 or 12 guys in it with their uh, small arms and small machine guns. And needless to say, they were in the process of really, really having a bad fight. They were in a world of straight. Gary wanted us to make a pass as soon as we got there. We could see the lights. Uh, so we were able to go straight to it. Flare ship tells me he's only got a limited number of flares. They had a flare ship being loaded at uh, Benoit, but it wouldn't be there for 35 minutes. 35 minutes in the dark, and these guys were dead. I mean, they were gone. So I told the flare ship, just drop one flare to have enough light to last for our mission. We get there. There are uh, helicopters in the area. Uh, the forward air controller... Uh, there's smoke on the ground, so you've got, and it's very late in the, well, by then it's 2, 2.30 in the morning. There's a ground fog, there's smoke. We have an overcast at about 7,000 feet of just real thin clouds. The flare light is reflecting off of all this stuff, so you've got a, just a kaleidoscope of confusion. 
And of course, you've got the artillery on the ground and the flashes and all that, which makes for real confusion and vision. Uh, Gary asked us to just space out and uh, just come off of a base leg roll in, but we had a restricted head in uh, on the target, which fighter pilots hate. Uh, because you have everybody has to fly the same path with enemy over here friendlies over here we want to be attacking the parallel enemy over here but we don't want to get over the friendlies and so you have to fly a rectangular pattern which means you're going to turn final almost in the same place every time and pull off in the same place every time the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese were not stupid they knew our tactics I mean the takes you about 30 minutes to figure that out if you've got a restricted run in guess where they put their flag sites or their uh, machine gun to set up well you put them about two miles out where the plane is going to be turning and about a mile out where they're going to be pulling off and you got a good shot at them while they're still in the flare light you got them highlighted with flare light shouting on top of them when they're rolling in and you've got them highlighted by the flare light when they're pulling out and he cleared in hot but then i'm back on base leg i call base leg uh, call turning in hot. I did not see Barry drop any munitions and I didn't hear him call off. And I called in hot and Gary said, you're cleared. And I'm in my final turn. I'm about oh, almost getting ready to roll out on my final turn when there was a massive explosion right in front of me. I was probably about, oh, I should have said we do these particular passes for CBU to at about 200 feet above the ground at 550 knots, which would be almost 600 miles an hour. We would be traveling at almost 1,100 and 1,150 feet per second. So you just you have no idea how long a second is. And just barely in front of the nose of the airplane, I have this massive explosion. And the question being, my, and instantly I knew that Barry had crashed. But it takes you a, a few seconds to really come to that realization. This is actually the, the plane that um, Mr. Couch flew in Vietnam, the 100 Super Saver. Is that one of the bases? There's some more uh, photos and documents uh, that this letter here is the letter that the uh, Marine Corps from the recruiting office, the recruiting station in, in Little Rock, sent to Mr. Odell's family um, after he had enlisted. And then that's actually Mr. Odell there. That's him again there with the code of conduct for military. This is just a, one of the uh, documents that he had made up while he was over there uh, to kind of pass the time. Here's another one. I like the, the Arkansas connection that he was keeping there. Well, this is Mr. Overall here in this clip. He's going to be talking about um, what it was like getting supplied while out in the field. Oops. Speaking of sea rations, you would you get choppered in some some food sometimes. Sometimes you didn't. You you'd starve quite a bit, and uh, especially during monsoon season when the choppers couldn't get in. But uh, when you did get sea rations, you would open the case up and turn it upside down so nobody would see what was in the boxes and you just took a chance at it and when once you saw what you got if you got ham and mothers where you didn't want that or you wanted something else well then you'd trade with somebody and i didn't drink coffee so i would trade the the packets of coffee for uh or, or i didn't smoke either so um uh, i would trade that for cocoa uh, they'd have uh, you, you'd get a candy bar in there and, and uh, that, uh, everybody wanted uh, peaches and pound cake that was that was to die for uh -huh. there were times when 
you would uh, you'd come to a hill where other Marines had been and you didn't have any food, well, you'd be scrounging. And I was good at scrounging. I, I was very good at it. And uh, I'd, you could go down the hill some, and, and whenever uh, a company would leave one hill, they would puncture some of the food that they weren't going to take with them, and they'd throw it down the hill. And by puncturing it, it, the food would go bad, and the enemy couldn't use it. Well, what you could, could do is you could open those cans up and scrape off the top of it and eat the bottom half of it. And uh, there's been many a time where I scraped the maggots off of something and ate the bottom part of it. Mm. And, and uh, you just learn to live with it. Uh, water. Um, I have drank out of bomb crater water. Uh, we would put iodine tablets in it and uh, Kool-Aid. <laughs> and, and, uh, you just learn uh, to deal with it. This is a, a, a drawing or a diagram that Mr. Odell had uh, made while he was over there. He, he, I didn't do a clip for it, but he told this very funny story about how him and some of the guys had learned that the, the officers in their unit were getting to have ice cream. And um, needless to say, the, the enlisted men weren't very happy about that. And so Mr. Rogel and some of his buddies devised this plan to, well, I won't sugarcoat it, to go in and steal the ice cream <laughs> for themselves. And so he, he tells the story, and this is kind of the, a layout of the camp. And um, he, he, he ended up telling about how they got in, they got the ice cream, and as they were trying to get out they were having to throw i forgot the size of the big tubs of ice cream big giant tubs throw them over a fence and uh, one of them hit the ground and bust open and uh, i remember mr old telling me that it was he was very upset because it was strawberry which was his favorite so he missed out on that um here just um uh, newspaper clipping and some more photos and uh, this scrap of paper there at the top is he had sent this home and different has a list of things that he was asking for his parents to send him like Jiffy popcorn um, Campbell soup you know homemade chocolate chip cookies fried pies that sort of thing what they were really looking for And then on the left here is a, a short timer calendar. A lot of guys, once they got short, as they would call it, uh, which means they, that their tour was coming to an end. Most tours were one year. Um, a lot of times they would mark those days on a calendar. And this Snoopy calendar here, I don't know if you can see it or not, but there, there are numbers in each little box starting at 100. And uh, so he would color them in each day that went by until he got to the day he was going home. And he, he, he was fortunate enough that he took some home movies. He had a camera while he was over there and he shared those with us. And I'll, I'll show you a little bit of what he uh, shared with us. And there, just so you know, there, there's no sound on these. So it's just going to be a uh, video. That's Mr. Odell there with the M60. You can get a good idea what some of the terrain was like going through the rice paddies there. Now this is just guys being funny, goofing off. This is 
back at base somewhere. Um, looks like they're having barbecue or some kind of event going on. Anyway, it's, it's, uh, it was neat to see those, and we were, we were glad that he shared these uh, pretty unique videos with us, or film, I should say. There he is shaving his baby face. Looks like he's about 16 there. This next uh, image here is a fellow named John Robinette who served in the U.S. Army, as you can see there. And uh, got a clip here of him talking about what it was like to build a uh, patrol base. We built patrol base dragon deep in the Hobo Woods and we were told we were the first Americans to actually spend a night there I don't know if that's true or not but we flew in air assaulted in the morning had to secure it I remember one I forget I forget if it was a dragon or Hensley one of them there was a hot LZ she thought shit we gotta clear the, we, gotta, we gotta fight a battle and then build the patrol base and so you flew in in the morning secured the area engineers would then come in plot out where the bunkers are going to be then the Hueys and the sky the sky crane would bring in a bulldozer a small bulldozer Hueys would bring drop in uh, empty sandbags and, and PSB perforated steel plates <laughs> that uh, made up the roofs of the bunkers and you had the rest of the day to build the bunkers and the uh, the uh, bulldozer would clear an area immediately around where we're going to be and then the helicopters usually Hueys would fly around and drop uh, what we didn't know at the time uh, would kill many of us later the Agent Orange uh, there's an old joke among Vietnam veterans. I died in Vietnam and didn't know it. Here are some more photos uh, from Mr. Robinette that he shared with us. Like I said, these are this is just a sampling of photos of the several thousand that we've got so far. The upper left one is they're out on a patrol somewhere, and the, the lower left um, you can see is one of those uh, bunkers that they made, you know, kind of crew bunkers with the, the ammo boxes and what basically whatever they could scrounge up. And then the upper right photos, obviously, either that hillside received some artillery fire or there are some bombs dropped off or something that's taking out all the vegetation. This next clip, Mr. Robinette's going to talk about um, being one of the missions after he was uh, inserted into an LZ, a landing zone. And this was, for the most part, a wide open area with uh, some tree lines. But the tree lines were you know, eight, ten feet deep, and then more field. It probably had been long abandoned rice paddies from 30 years before. And so we didn't feel, you know, we weren't going to get ambushed. Or they'd have hit us when we landed. And that's when you're the most vulnerable. They, they did like shoot down helicopters. First thing you told the new guy was, step where I step. But if you get within about three feet of me, I'm going to shoot you. I mean, you know, keep your distances, keep your, your gaps, and step where I step. Because mines and booby traps were an enormous hazard. They were everywhere. So we're going this way, or for the camera like that. Every one of us is making a new path. And if you're, if you're advancing on a tree line where you expect bad guys, that's, that's okay. But this wasn't okay. Hel you know, the helicopters dropped us off, took off. We started moving, and it was like the world ended. Guy on the left side, it was either Ayers or, or, or Ryan. I don't remember which. It tripwire. 
two 155 rounds go off. 155 is the second largest artillery in the Army inventory. Third largest, maybe. But, I mean, it's a big ass cannon. Mm-hmm. And every one of us was within the killing range, probably of both. I was picked up and redeposited. I don't know if it was two feet, I don't know if it was six feet. But I do kind of remember, time slows down. It really does. Uh, but I remember being propelled, and I remember hearing and feeling the rush of wind and stuff mm. all around me. And I was deposited back on the ground. I had no idea what happened. The VA doctor told me a few years ago that I probably had a, a what do they call it, a traumatic brain injury. I looked to my right, brand new guy, first day in the bush. I'll never know his name. He's messed up. His leg is a mess. I, stay put. Stay put. I don't know what's going on. I, I, I bring my rifle out in front of me. I'm, I'm faced out now, and I'm looking out, and my heart's beating, and I'm trying to pray. And the mother of Jesus and I got to be real close in Vietnam. I'm Catholic. And I was a really good Catholic. In Vietnam. <laughs> I couldn't remember the words of the Hail Mary. Huh. I kept trying to say they are Father. Couldn't remember the words, and I'm just you know. And I looked to my left, and there's John Trottier. He's our he's our um, sniper. He's okay. He gets up about a couple months later, but he's okay. And we look around, and it's just devastation. I probably carried bodies to the helicopters. I don't remember. There were three of us left standing out of about 20, 21. Uh, I think we had four killed. We should have all been killed. This next clip is back with uh, Mr. Mitchell, who, as I said before, was a a corpsman attached to the Marines. And he's kind of relating a... uh, a funny story about going out into the field for the first time. Well, when I first reported, I was given orders to uh, uh, dig a foxhole, and uh, I had a shelter half that I used for getting out of rain with you'd put it up like a tent if you had a buddy you could use two of them and make a tent <clears throat> but uh, all I had was the uh, the shelter half and you just staked it up before you could get under it and it provided uh, shade from the sun and uh, uh, kept you dry or I say dry kept rain falling <laughs> on you if it did rain and uh, on the uh, orders to dig the uh, foxhole. Like, like I say, I was super green at that time also. Had spent any time out in the field. And uh, uh, I got an e-tool and went back to my location and proceeded to dig this uh, foxhole. And uh, the range told me that I needed to dig it uh, as wide as my body was and deep enough to where I would be flush or below the top of the ground in case we got rocket attack, mortar or whatever and the blast would go over you and uh, it was probably 105 in the shade that day and the ground was hard as concrete and uh, I decided that hole was deep enough and wide enough and uh, I saw some rains just less than 30 steps away sitting behind a uh, M60 machine gun and uh, sat down and started talking to them and uh, I was asking them different questions about you know what uh, how everything worked out there because like I say I knew nothing about it and I asked one of them I said well where's where's the front line here perimeter and uh, he pointed to the end of his M60 and he said that's the front line right there (laughs) And I went back and I picked up my e-tool and uh, the ground got soft, temperature dropped 20 degrees and I didn't have any problem to get in my hole deep enough before I <laughs> felt a little bit safer. Mm-hmm. But that was my introduction. 
next clip, Robert Brown, uh, he was a radio relay man, and he's talking about being out at a forward observation post. Got off the hill a couple of days after this event where the North Vietnamese regulars were overrunning. Well, at least that's what the guys told me, that we were being overrun. Since I'm in the bunker with the radio, I'm not out on the perimeter seeing anything. Right. But uh, the grunts called and said they needed more firepower and asked us to come out and you know, help them protect the, the station. Well, it was just to, to help because it was... But uh, I was trained by this guy named Zolt Nagatini. He was a Polish guy. And uh, Zolt gave me a, a frequency to use that if you ever get in any serious trouble, he said, get on this frequency and you'll get hit just like that. Okay? So I remembered that at that moment and uh, rather than going out to help them fight, I got on that frequency. And when I hit it, just right there, the spooky one one. And, you know, the boss was shaking the spooky one one. What's your twenty? You know, what situation? I told him we're being overrun, and uh, maybe seemed like within seconds you heard and with that <laughs> you see a red line coming out the sky. And the red line will be just slowly going around, slow. And so uh, I didn't know what it was, but I know you could hear the, the screams of the uh, North Vietnamese. And it uh, it did the job. I mean, it, I didn't know what the spooky one one was. And that's one of the things I wanted to look up. I mean, I know I know it's a uh, Air Force. Uh, airplane that has all this firepower in it. I mean, I know what it is now, but then I didn't know what a spooky one won. I think when I got back stateside, Puff the Magic Dragon was another term that was used for it. That's Mr. Brown there in the younger day when he was, uh, right before he was shipped over to Vietnam and is looking good in his Marine Corps uniform there, his dress This next thing, uh, it is from John Simmons, who was uh, in the U.S. Army, and um, he had this device, which he brought in I had never seen before. It's picture there in the lower right. It's like a, a little recording device, and it had these two, you can see the tapes there. He had these tapes. They were little um, two-track, you know, you think about eight-track. Well, these were two-track tapes and that they would make short recordings. So basically he would kind of just record a letter home, if you would, and then he would mail it home. And then his mother or father or, or whoever would um, make a recording to him, mail it back, and then he could listen to it. And uh, he saved, he actually had a couple of these that um, made it through all these years and he shared them with us. and. This is, um, I'm not going to play the whole thing, but this is kind of just uh, part of the recording, or one part of the recording. Well, I got your letter today with the clothes and everything in it. And things are about the same here. Everything's going along fine. I'm sitting in the barracks right now, not doing much of anything, waiting for about 3.30 to go on to go to work. It's real windy here today. It's a little warm, but I guess that's to be expected here. Uh, if you hear planes or helicopters or anything in the background, it's uh, not unusual since we're about 75, maybe 100 yards from the flight line. The planes come in every day, day and night, so after a while you get used to it, but 
but it takes a while. It's why I like getting used to the dump trucks out on Highway 65. The work I'm doing here is not hard. It gets a little boring at times, a lot of paperwork and everything. You can actually, um, all of these clips that I'm showing, you, you can hear these online if you go to the uh, Vietnam War Project website, and uh, you can hear the full uh, uh, the full recordings. This next one, is, I'm just going to play a section of uh, Mr. Greenberg here. He was a pilot on an uh, AC-119 gunship in the Air Force, and uh, they made a recording of one of their missions I'm not going to play the whole thing because it's over three hours long, but we'll play just a little short clip of it. Twenty two December seventy two, mission number five two eight one, call sign stinger four three, tail number nine four five, aircraft commander Greenberg. The NAV team is McGovern, NAV, Wood, Flair, Robertson, Nas. The co-pilot is friend and an additional crew member, Sontag. Chief uh, flight engineer is Hotary. Solid now, but I think he uh, dropped his flare right over the bomb dump where I put mine the other night. All right. Well, that makes me feel better anyway. <laughs> you didn't really thought I dropped one over the down bump, did you? I put one right in the middle of it the other night. Oh, shit. Scale, did you hear that? It's in our box. I might as well get it. Okay, Nas, uh, as you look at that thing, we just came down a road that's uh, in the north. Pretty good-sized road, and then it comes down and it diagonals off to the southwest, and then it goes to the west. And this is an extension off the road that goes north and south. Is that check? That's a rush. Okay, we're within the box, pilot. Oh, okay. Can't be a I have a gigantic fire to the east of, uh, of this road. Down there, uh, about 500 meters to the north of that fence where it bends off to the southeast. A gigantic fire. You said it's 500 meters north of where the thing bends off towards the southwest? You mean? Yes, sir. No, we can't go after that. That's, two, that's 200 meters north. Right. Looks like something flaring up down there, doesn't it? Yeah, that's why it's pointing to you before. I just say point to it, see it, it stop. Yeah. There's a trip. Anyways, like I said, you you can hear the whole recording on, on the website if you'd like to. Uh, they they flew those missions at night. They only flew at night, and uh, so it's it's pretty interesting to listen to the whole thing. Um, in this next clip, David Haas is talking about, um, I guess you could call it lost time. I was there in 67, 68, and part of 69. Uh, and basically, we got Stars and Stripes magazine, and we got to see that. But as far as knowing what really went on, uh, there was very little that we knew about what was going on back here. It would drift in after the fact, you know. Uh, Robert Kennedy's death, uh, Martin Luther King's death, those things uh, came in later. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was, it, it, it's just kind of like you weren't in the real world. You were just off on, a, on an island. You were away from everything. And, and uh, I told my wife, I said, I lost two years of my life. She said, what do you mean? I said, well, I was over there, and it I don't know what happened here. Mm -hmm. These are just a, a few more just sampling of things that we've got. Um, these are some propaganda flyers. Just some more photos. We've gotten all kinds of photos. It's a pretty uh, diverse bunch. You know, we've got guys flashing peace signs, USO shows. 
We even got photos of outdoor facilities, and um, looks like they get a good, good supply of toilet paper. So that you know that was important. And we even got a Santa Claus there, kind of a uh, I think he's a pretty creepy looking Santa Claus. I don't think I'd want to see him come to my house. Um, in this next clip, Esau Kearney, he's uh, talking about uh, his trip home. Looking forward to boarding the plane and, you know, getting back to the world. So that's what we call it, back to the world, back to the States. As we left, I believe it was at Cameron uh, Bay, the same area that we came in. And boarded you know, the charter aircraft and uh, left the Eden. And that was one experience, you know, no one that I never forget. Uh, it was a little different than coming in. You can hear the jubilation. Um, of course, again, we had to do the particular maneuvers in the large transport plane. Uh, you could feel the pull and the sway, you know, the acceleration, the deep. Uh, climbs and the high pitches and what have you to get out of the uh, combat zone. <clears throat> but once we got to a certain height, um, the captain would say, we are now safe. We're out of the combat theater. And there was jubilations like <laughs> guys taking the heads off, throwing them in the air. It's similar to once you graduate from college. Uh, there's some this it was so overjoyed to be able to return home. They just took the heads off and threw them. But, you know, we all did. We could let our emotions flow with that. Mm -hmm. So that was a wonderful time. In this uh, last clip here is um, David Toss talking about what it was like once he actually got back home. process uh, out of uh, Seattle Tacoma and that was the end of my enlistment with the, the army and before they put us on the buses they told us you're going to meet protesters at uh, Seattle Tacoma Airport uh, and you're not allowed to touch them put a hand on them or say anything to them and we walked through there and, and one girl walked up and spit on me called me a baby killer and uh, that, that upset me. Uh, that was the worst that I got here other than when I got back in Little Rock, you didn't, you didn't tell anybody you'd been to Vietnam. You just tried to blend in and, and uh, just it, it wasn't talked about. And it wouldn't, nobody cared. Well, that's it for the presentation today. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the Arkansas Vietnam War Project, I encourage you to, to check out the website. You can either just uh, Google Arkansas Vietnam War Project and it'll come up, or you can go through robertslibrary.org, part of the Central Arkansas Library System. And I think now we're going to take questions if we have any. We don't have any yet, but I did put the link to the website directly into the comments so people can click on that and go directly Excellent. directly to it. So we'll give people a couple of minutes. Um, Robert Brown was my sixth grade science teacher. Brian knows this story, but he was my sixth grade science teacher and um, my father did not fight in Vietnam because he doesn't have sight. And um, so Mr. Brown was my window into Vietnam. He told us very honestly about his experiences. And as a sixth grade student, it was shocking and fascinating. And um, he was, he's an amazing teacher. So I was glad to see his clip. I told people you were wrapping up and to go ahead and type their questions. So I don't okay. see any questions. Um, but you can always contact Brian um, on through the robertslibrary.org website. You can find his email address and his phone number and get all, um, 
all of your questions asked and and we're still doing interviews right i mean right you're still yeah. taking we, you, stuff right you know with the the pandemic happening it's it's kind of altered things a little bit obviously but um yeah we're we're very much still interested in collecting stories well good well great well, thank you, Brian, for doing this. Thanks for your patience um, with me and the technology. Um, I think I may have figured out what I did wrong. <laughs> That's what I've spent the hour trying to figure out. Where did I? Where did this mess up? But this was this was great, and it will be on YouTube forever now. So we're going to edit out the the mistake in the middle. But um, but 